So far we've uh, been introduced to the Thanksgiving section and we've had a brief discussion on its source and its form or structure. Now we turn to the most important question and that is its function. Because uh, Paul could have, I mean after all he can do whatever he wants as the letter writer, he could jump directly from the opening to the th the body of the letter. So you have to ask yourself why does he have this extra material? What, what, what does he accomplish? What does he gain by including at the beginning of the letter this Thanksgiving section? And uh, there are three functions that uh, are important for us to identify and then also see when we read these uh, epistolary units in Paul's letters. Now the first one I've entitled the pastoral function because I envision Paul the pastor praying for his readers. So to understand this function, you have to first of all remind yourself that obviously there was no email in the ancient world. There was no phone, no fax, no Skyping. So when Paul writes to his uh, different churches, almost always it's the first contact he's had with them since he was there. And it's important when you haven't seen anyone for a while to first of all reconnect with a particular person. Let's imagine that um, you and I know each other from a class some while ago and we haven't seen each other until now, right? And so now we're back in a course together and you've done something in the past to kind of make me a little annoyed or frustrated and the first time I see you after some part of party I say, now, now I, you know, I, I'm still upset with you about, see that doesn't work very well, right? I first have to, to what, reconnect with you, I have to say, hey, you know, long time no see, you know, how's it going? You know, how's the family? You know, how's your ministry situation? And then after we reconnect, then it might be appropriate for me to say, now I, I hate to bring this up, but you know, we still have unresolved. You know. Now, it's not just though that, that Paul reconnects in a, in a kind of calculating way, but, but Paul in a more pastoral way wants to. It may be that I actually care about you as a student, and so I don't have to forcibly ask all those nicety questions so we can reconnect, but I am interested in you and what's happening in your life and your ministry. And that's a better analogy for understanding Paul. So he's writing to Christians that he hasn't abandoned, he hasn't forgotten about, that he does care about, and so he wants to reconnect with them, he wants to reassure them of his care, his love for them, and how does he do that? Well, he does that with unit number two, right? He says, I'm remembering you in my prayers. So another point for you to maybe think about and reflect on. And that is, prayer for others is a powerful expression of love. In fact, I'm always impressed when people say, you know, I'm praying for you. And I'm kind of always surprised. I'm a bit taken back. It's like, well, I, I didn't think that, you know, I was that important to you or that you cared about me that much. Because if you pray for me, if you say that and actually do it, well then that means you have to think about me even when I'm not there. And not only think about me, but you actually have to take your valuable time and pray for me. I have that sometimes, you know, I show up in a church and, and on the way in it's usually a, an elderly saint who says something like, I've been praying for you. That's quite something. They don't even know me, but they've been remembering me in their prayers. In fact, I, I must admit that I rarely tell other people that I'm going to pray for them. And it's not because I think it's a bad thing to do. No, no, no. It's a great thing to do and to say. It's just that I, I know how bad I am at delivering. I, I've hard enough time praying for myself, let alone another person. And so when somebody says they'll pray for you, that's a powerful expression of their love, their care for you. And Paul accomplishes all of that with the Thanksgiving section. So he not only reconnects with them, but he reconnects with them in a way that highlights his love, his care for them. He says, I'm praying for you. I'm remembering you in my prayers. And that's one important benefit or gain that Paul has by having and including in his letters a Thanksgiving section. Here's a second one. We can call this the exhortative function. I call this in colloquial terms persuasion through praise. Persuasion through praise. Because most of us want to live up to the praise that others have of us. So, for instance, if I said of my class, right, I said, oh, I give thanks to God for you guys. I mean, you show up class on time, you, you know, you pay attention to all things that I say, you ask great questions, you laugh at my corny jokes. Well, I'm kind of putting a little bit of pressure on them to what? To keep on showing up on class on time and to keep on paying attention and to keep on asking good questions and to keep on laughing at my corny jokes. 
And so when Paul, so to say, points his hand up in the sky and says, I give thanks to God for you guys, you know, and for what you do, and quite often it'll be your, I'll say, Thessalonians, your, your, your work of faith and your labor of love and your steadfastness of hope. Well, that puts implicit pressure on the Thessalonians to keep on demonstrating that work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. And sometimes that pressure isn't always implicit, but sometimes it can be explicit. Whenever you have the number five, right, the, the prayer report, Remember, there's nothing subtle about my saying to my son, you know, oh, mom and dad are praying that you'll study hard and that you use the gifts that God has given to you and you'll be wise in, in terms of your choices about, you know, people to hang out with and what to do. But there's nothing implicit. My son walks away knowing exactly what it is that we hope and are praying for in his life. And so in those Thanksgiving sections where Paul has that fifth prayer report, then the paranesis, the Greek word for exhortation, the exhortative function, isn't merely implicit, but it is explicit. Well, the third, and I don't think it's fair to say the most important function, but it's one that often isn't fully recognized, is the foreshadowing function, the foreshadowing function. I have a table of contents here because if I have a book at a bookstore or a library and I want to know what it's about, I look at the table of contents. It would be too much for me to say, and I would be overstating the case, if I claim that a thanksgiving is like a table of contents. However, I would be understating the case, and you would be missing something if you didn't appreciate the fact that Paul is such a skilled letter writer that he already knows what he's going to talk about in the body of the letter, right from the get-go, and he foreshadows, he anticipates those key themes already in the thanksgiving section. A good modern analogy from the movies is the Thanksgiving section is a preview of coming attractions. You go to the movie theater, you pay way too much you know, to go in, and then you pay a lot more money for some popcorn and a drink, and then you sit down, and then finally you get to watch your movie, right? No, well, that's not what happens. You have to sit through these previews. And actually, it's not so bad because they pick them with care, and they're kind of entertaining. And in a certain sense, then, Paul's Thanksgiving sections are a preview of coming attractions. Paul looks ahead. He, he, he quickly addresses two things. Not only the topic, the key themes, the subject matter he's going to be talking about in the body of the letter, but also, and this is somewhat related but yet distinct, and that is the tone or the character in which this conversation is going to be had. So let's first talk about the one thing, the, the content, the subject matter of the letter. Now, that's important for you to realize if you're going to preach or teach on a Thanksgiving section. No matter what model or theory of preaching or teaching you have, most people would say that uh, you first of all have to identify what is the main idea in a text or the central teaching. And you can see how you would be frustrated or maybe find it impossible to do in a Thanksgiving section. But instead of uh, being angry at Paul and maybe concluding that Paul's a confused thinker, he's jumping around from subject to subject, he can't stay on track, you ought to instead think, wow, this is impressive. Paul has deliberately right, just mentioned briefly some things in a foreshadowing way right, that he will develop in a greater detail in the body of the letter to come. So understand that and anticipate that whenever you deal with a thanksgiving section. It's a different kind of species or genre. It has a different character than the other passages within the letter that in a more concentrated and focused way deal with a one particular subject or problem theme. But we also said that the thanksgiving section foreshadows not just the the content of the letter, but also its tone and character. And I've come to appreciate much more so in the last number of years how important that is to interpretation, to hear the right tone. So on the one extreme, are we in a kind of Philippians or Thessalonians worldview? It's a Barney worldview, right? I love you, you love me. I mean, you know, there are all these warm fuzzies that exist between Paul and this healthy church with whom he has a, a strong, positive, loving relationship. Or are we way on the other end of the spectrum? Are we like in the Galatians, right? Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, nincompoops. And, and, and you know, the people pushing circumcision, I wish they'd go all the way and castrate themselves. Ooh, it's kind of cold in here, isn't it? Is it? Or is it kind of in between? Is it like maybe the Thessalonians where there's a little bit of tension in the air, but, you know, it's not completely bad or destroyed the relationship yet. 
And so the Thanksgiving section will foreshadow not only the topics, but the tone in which you know Paul and the church are going to have this conversation. The tone in which you ought to read and interpret the rest of the letter. Well, uh, just to show that I'm not out in left field about these things, you can see here one quote from Paul Schubert. The date is kind of interesting, 1939, because you may remember that literary criticism in general, and therefore a literary approach to letters, are more recent phenomena, so he was kind of ahead of his time. But he already said then that, quote, each Thanksgiving not only announces clearly the subject matter of the letter, but also foreshadows unmistakably its stylistic qualities, the degrees of intimacy, and other characteristics. Peter O'Brien is an evangelical scholar from uh, Australia, and he revisited in his thesis, which was published, the Thanksgiving sessions, and he says, among other things, we note in these periods, these parts of the letter, right, the Thanksgiving sections, an epistolary function, in other words, to introduce and indicate the main themes of the letters. So here's a quote that highlights that third foreshadowing function. But he's aware of these other functions too. Notice this longer quote. He says, Paul's introductory Thanksgivings have a varied function, epistolary, didactic, and parenetic, in other words, exhortative, and they provide evidence of his pastoral and or apostolic concern for the addressees. In some cases, one purpose may predominate while others recede into the background. But whatever the thrust of any passage, it's clear that Paul's introductory thanksgivings were not meaningless devices. Instead, they were integral parts of their letters, setting the tone and themes of what was to follow. So, nice reference to the different functions that a thanksgiving has, and also that phrase that Paul's introductory thanksgivings were not meaningless devices. Instead, integral parts of their letters. That's the point I've been trying to stress in these presentations, and also in the article from Romans that you perhaps have already read. Well, that then deals somewhat in theory with the most important question, namely the function of the letter. Let's look quickly at a couple of examples of how that foreshadowing function might be seen in uh, the text. So the first example is Galatians 1, 6 to 10. Galatians 1, 6 to 10. Now, if you looked at the letter opening it, as a whole, it would be kind of a nice summary of what we've seen so far. If you pull out your Bible and, and look up that text for a moment, that would be helpful. And I'm going to do the same thing here for a moment, if I can. I guess I'll work from memory instead. Next time I'll be better prepared. Um, Paul has changed everything in the opening of Galatians so that it fits the epistolary situation. So we saw, for instance, it begins normal enough, Paul. And you have the title apostle. But then we had that double negative, not from men nor through a man. And so we saw how that was a preemptive strike against the Judaizers and their undermining of Paul's apostolic status. And also the reference to all the brothers with me. Paul brings in as many witnesses as possible to, 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 to show that, that all these people to agree that he is an apostle, not from men nor through a man. He didn't get his apostleship from the head boys in Jerusalem. right? He got it directly from Jesus Christ himself. Then secondly, we get the recipients, and we see the expected, although it's a little unusual with the plural, to the churches in Galatia. And I went cricket, cricket, cricket. You hear the deafening silence as Paul has no positive descriptive phrase. He can't acknowledge in any positive way their relationship to God and or Christ. That's too bad. And then we have the greeting, which at first blush is normal, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he had that expanded part on the work of Christ, right, who gave himself for our sins and who rescues us from the present evil age, to whom be glory forever and ever. And we saw that also as a preemptive strike, defending not Paul's apostleship, but Paul's gospel, highlighting the fact that his gospel differs from the Judaizers' gospel, their Jesus plus gospel, which undermined the full sufficiency of Christ's redemptive work. Now at this point, if you haven't looked ahead, you should expect Paul to say either Eucharisto, I give thanks, or the plural Eucharistumen, we give thanks. But when you look at the text, that's not what you find. Instead of a thanksgiving section, you find a, an astonishment section, a rebuke section. You see, I hope, what Paul has done. The situation in Galatia is so bad and so serious that Paul can't in any way give thanks to God for them. 
And so he's deleted or he's taken away the Thanksgiving section and he's replaced it with an astonishment section in which his language is very hot. It's very angry. It's very heated. He says, I'm astonished that you've so quickly abandoned or moved away from this one gospel, which is, you know, moved to this other gospel, which is no gospel at all. And his language is pretty angry. He says, if, if, if anybody comes to you, you know, with some other gospel that's different than the one that we brought to you before, let that person be cursed. When was the last time you said that about somebody? Let that person be cursed. And so here in Galatians, you can see in a powerful way how, how the Thanksgiving section, or more precisely the replacement of the Thanksgiving section with an astonishment section, foreshadows the, well, the anger of Paul in this letter and the very serious uh, threat to the heart of the gospel. Let's look at the next example. It comes from the Thanksgiving section in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. So it's not easy to find it in your Bible. I'll give you a second to page over there, and maybe you'll hit the pause button and give yourself a chance to do that. But it's easy to, to find it. You just look where the text begins with, I give thanks, or we give thanks, and you find that then in verse uh, verse 4, right? And uh, right away, though, we notice something interesting. Paul says, um, uh, I give thanks to God for... And remember, we expect normally for him to point his finger to his readers and say, for what you have done, either faith, hope, and love, or some other characteristic uh, that the church is positively identifying. But that's not what we find here in 1 Corinthians. We instead find, I give thanks to God, not for, oh wait a minute, not for what you have done, but for what God has done. I give thanks to God for His grace given to you. Now this is a subtle but a very significant change. You, you, you understand what Paul is cleverly doing when you know a little bit about the Corinthian situation. We're talking about a church that was very gifted, and Paul freely admits in the rest of the Thanksgiving section that they've been enriched in all their speaking and in all their knowledge so that you don't like any spiritual gifts. So Paul says, yeah, okay, I get it. You guys are gifted. But the trouble is the Corinthian church knew that they were gifted, and they took pride in their giftedness. In fact, they were using their giftedness not in the way that they were supposed to, to build up others, to build up the body of the church. They were using in them to build up themselves. And so there was this problem of pride at work in the Corinthian church, and Paul addresses that problem at great length in the body of the letter. And then what does he do already here in the Thanksgiving section? He, he already is foreshadowing that concern. He follows a strategy that, well, I could say, is a strategy my mother followed when giving advice to my wife before we got married. My wife and I will be married uh, pretty soon, almost 30 years. And it was only about uh, maybe eight or so years ago that I found out that my mother had a conversation with my wife before we got married. I didn't know that that happened, and I was naturally interested. What in the world would my mother say to my wife? You know, what would be these words of wisdom about me that she would give? Well, it turns out that she said something that was short, but not very sweet. She said about me, she said, Don't praise him too much. You see, my mom thinks I have a big head, a big ego, and so she didn't want my bride, my blushing bride, to exacerbate the problem and feed my ego, and so she said to her, Don't praise him too much. And in a similar way, Paul, writing to an overly proud Corinthian church, a church that was indeed gifted, but wrongly took pride in their gifts. Paul doesn't want to exacerbate the problem, he wants to correct the problem. And so he very cleverly and he very skillfully says at the very beginning, I give thanks to God for not what you guys are doing, that would only feed their problem of pride, but what God is doing, His grace given to you in Christ Jesus. In fact, uh, a little later on, Paul will say to the Corinthians in the body of the letter, What do you have that you did not receive? Right? What, what thing are you so proud of that, that wasn't given to you? And then he follows it up by saying, Well, if you received it, why do you boast as if you didn't? How can you boast and be overly proud about something that, well, was only given to you freely? But there's more in the Thanksgiving section, too, that foreshadows uh, the theme of the letter and the topics that Paul will talk about. If you look at the, the two things that Paul gives thanks to God for, the causal section, right, because of what? It isn't faith, hope, and love, but it's two things. It's, it can be translated a different way, but one has to do with your speech, and the other has to do with your knowledge. Let's talk about speech for a minute. That's not so innocent either. Because if you read the Corinthian letters pretty quick, you'll find out that they were really into people who talked good. Well, I did that deliberately. I should have said who talk well. In other words, in the ancient world, this whole business of rhetoric, I mean, people, 
It was like a, a very important sport. People went to school to be trained in their speaking. People had speaking competitions, and, and you could make a lot of money if, if you won these competitions and you were hired by cities to be their spokesmen and so forth. And this was a, a problem in the church because the Corinthians wanted a gospel that would be rhetorically impressive. And, and that didn't happen with Paul. In fact, when Paul preached a gospel, well, uh, Paul's version of the gospel, especially when he talked about the cross and about the resurrection, well, some people uh, approved that message to be a stumbling block and others considered it to be foolishness. And especially this business about, about this Jesus guy who died and came out of the grave, ha, 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 ha. The same thing that people reacted in Athens to that message, that's how people would naturally react in the ancient world, this idea of a body coming back to life. And so... There were no 10 out of 10s, you know, that people were holding up after Paul's sermons. And they tended to hold up a 10 or at least a 9 over other people who preached instead. Uh, uh, and so there, there is this kind of difficult problem that Paul is dealing with in uh, the letter. The desire of the Corinthians for Paul to preach in a more impressive way. And Paul foreshadows that already by talking about speech. But he does so in a way to correct them. Because in the body of the letter, chapter 3, for example, Paul will say, I didn't come to you with, quote, fine-sounding arguments. Paul says, I could have come to you with impressive speech in which, well, I didn't do that. Why? Because I didn't want you to leave church saying, wow, what a preacher. I instead focused on Jesus Christ and him crucified because I wanted you to leave church saying, wow, what a savior. And so the reference, the change from from faith, hope, and love in the Thanksgiving section to saying, well, first of all, we give thanks for speech, right? That's an important part of a topic he's going to talk about. And then the second thing in which it's foreshadowed has to do with knowledge. And that, too, comes up in the letter time and time again. One big text, for example, is chapter 8, verse 1. Paul will say, knowledge does one thing, love does another. Knowledge, right, puffs up, but love builds up. And there are too many sad examples of how the Corinthian church are misusing their knowledge, right, to think of themselves as being better or superior to others, or using their knowledge to justify things that ought not to be done. And so the two references in the Thanksgiving section, the two causes, the reason for Thanksgiving, are foreshadowed already in the Thanksgiving section. Yet a third way in which Paul has adapted or uh, tweaked this Thanksgiving section is found in his references to the end times. Now to appreciate what he does in thanks here in 1 Corinthians, you have to know what he normally does with the Thanksgiving section. Paul typically ends his Thanksgiving in what we might call an eschatological climax. An eschatological climax. Okay, a climax is where you hit a high point. Okay, eschatological means okay something having to do with the end time. And this makes, I think, certain logical sense, uh, I hope, to you. If you have a prayer, for instance, maybe a communal prayer in church, you might say, okay, the first part of the prayer, I'll, I'll go back in time, and I'll talk about the past and all the great things that God has done in the past. And then we'll talk about the present, maybe the things God is doing, or maybe our needs here in the present, here and now. And then you might have something with the future, referring to the coming of Christ and how all things have been made new. And then after all that, it's a great time to say, amen, right? You kind of hit a, a climax, or... Or um, I, I sometimes find myself ending my prayers by quoting, say, from Philippians, you know, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the already existing fact that Jesus is Lord. And then it's good to say, Amen, because you've hit an eschatological climax. And Paul does this in his thanksgivings. So, for instance, in 1 Thessalonians, I know we're looking at 1 Corinthians now, but I'm just going to give you a reference to 1 Thessalonians, the thanksgiving section there, verse 10. If you look at how it ends, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, Paul 1 refers to, to wait for his son from the heavens. What's that referring to? Well, it's referring to the second coming. Jesus, we're, we're waiting, the Thessalonians are waiting for Jesus Christ to return. And then the last part of the verse is also important, right? To rescue us from the coming wrath. What's that talking about? It's the final judgment. When is that wrath going to take place? Well, when Jesus comes again. So you can see it. For instance, at the end of the Thanksgiving section of Thessalonians, how Paul reaches an eschatological climax. Now, if you know all of that, then you can better appreciate what Paul does in the Thanksgiving section of 1 Corinthians. If you look at, I think it's verse 
7, and then starting verse 7 and 8, there's not one, there's not two, but there's three references to the end of time. First of all, we talk about, about the revelation, right? To wait for his appearing from the heavens. And this is the first reference, clear one, to the second coming of Jesus. And then I think the first part of the next verse says, uh, he will keep you strong to the end. And the end is, uh, you know, not next week or the end of this year or, you know, the end of my next missionary journey. No, that's the end of time. And then the clearest reference is then found in the following verse. It talks about, being found blameless on the day of the Lord. Right? A, a third explicit reference to the end of time Jesus returns. Now, the few scholars who notice that Paul has emphasized Jesus' second coming in this Thanksgiving section have rightly seen a connection with one of the purposes of the letter. And that is, these Corinthians were so proud of themselves their spiritual gifts, which they don't deserve, but which have been given to them by grace through God. In fact, spiritual gifts have the name grace right in them. They're grace gifts, charismata. But in addition to that, foolish way of thinking is, was the sense that they had already arrived. They had spiritually already reached, so to say, uh, I won't say a state of perfection, but, you know, a state that certainly was good enough. Um... Paul will kind of sarcastically talk about that. I think it's chapter 4 where he'll say something like, you guys have already become kings. I mean, you have kind of passed us. You know, you're ahead of us apostles. You're already in the state of kingship. And then Paul somewhat wryly says, quote, I wish you had become kings so that we might share the reign with you. Right? You haven't become kings despite what you think of this exalted status you have. And, and therefore, you know, we, we, we can't really share this thing, this great thing that you don't really have. And so Paul, in the thanksgiving section, wants to already foreshadow the fact that they, they need to, well, they, they haven't arrived. In effect, they're never going to arrive until the great and glorious day of Jesus' return. They have to be busy. There has to be a sense of uh, urgency to their ministry because they have to be found blameless on the day of the Lord. And so Paul foreshadows that corrective theology, that corrective way of thinking he develops in the body of the letter. He foreshadows it with not one, not two, but three references in the Thanksgiving section to uh, the end of time. Well, I'm sorry I didn't have notes for all of that, but I'm sure that you took uh, some notes by hand, and you can also review this uh, video if you want to go back to some details. I want to give you yet a third example, a third and maybe strongest example of the foreshadowing function of a Thanksgiving section, and it comes from Thessalonians. So there are four main themes that we meet in the Thessalonian letters, and every one of them is foreshadowed in the Thanksgiving section. So what I want to do is first show you the theme as it's found in the Thanksgiving section, and then show you how it's found in the body of the letter, thereby hopefully proving to you that the Thanksgiving section is a carefully written section that foreshadows the main topics to come. It's a preview of coming attractions in this letter. So one of the themes of 1 Thessalonians, and I'm going quickly through them, We'll cover these things, of course, in greater detail when we get to 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians in, our, in the rest of our course. But one of the themes is to develop Paul's integrity. You can see here in the slide you have a businessman, and he's different than all the rest because all the other men, they're businessmen because they're wearing a suit, and all the other guys have long noses. And that means, obviously, that they're liars, that they don't have integrity. This guy has a good nose, and what's more, he's got a halo over his head. And so one of the things that is at work in the Thessalonian letter is that Paul's opponents, unlike Galatia, who are inside the church, his opponents are outside the church, and they are challenging not Paul's apostolic credentials, but they're challenging his character, his integrity. They're saying that Paul was only a charlatan. He was like all the other wandering preacher and teachers of that day. They're like the used car salesmen of the ancient world. They'll say anything and do anything for a buck or for people to say nice things about them. And so Paul, in the Thanksgiving section, has a couple of ways in which he already defends his character, his integrity. Verse 5a, he says, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Sometimes we talk about people who are all words, right? All, 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 all words and no action. Well, Paul says, I came to you with words, and those words were important. Those are the words of the gospel. But I also came to you with power, a power that was seen, first of all, in the Holy Spirit, a likely allusion to the miracles that Paul did by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also with not just conviction, but with deep conviction. This is the idea, and you know this too, when you hear somebody 
talk, maybe even a professor, right? Where they're kind of bored and they're not really into what they're saying. They're just kind of dialing it in, as we say in modern expression or parlance, right? As opposed to somebody who's really excited about what they're saying. They're passionate about what they're saying. They believe in what they're saying. And what Paul says to the Thessalonians is, now you go back in time and, and when you were there, you know, right? You know that that uh, that we came to you not just with empty words, so to say, but we came to you not only with power shown in the working of the Holy Spirit, but we came to you with with the uh, with deep conviction. We were very passionate about what we believed and what we said. And then the other reference is to how we lived among you for your sake. I call this an argument from first-hand experience. Paul says, "You know, right? Don't believe what those other people are saying about me. Don't even believe what I'm saying about me. Just believe yourself." It's a good argument because most of us do believe ourselves, even though we are uh, prone to make a mistake. But Paul says, you know, right? You were there. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You know that when we were among you, we didn't sponge off of you for free housing or free food, but we worked night and day, right, to provide for ourselves and so forth. So Paul in the Thanksgiving section is foreshadowing this theme he's going to pick up in the body of the letter, his integrity. And there's another verse which I'm not going to take time to uh, explain now, but that key term, isodos, is an important one, also found in the Thanksgiving section that foreshadows this theme. Now, if you look at the Thanksgiving section, is it found in the body of the letter, this theme of Paul's integrity? And the answer is yes, big time. The body of the letter begins in chapter 2, and Paul has a long section defending, first of all, how he acted in the past, when he was there for his three-plus Sabbaths. And then he has another section in which he has to defend why he hasn't come back, because you see his opponents have said something like, well, if he really cared about you, how come he hasn't come back? Right? I heard he hasn't visited you once since he ran out of town, scared like a, like a dog between, with, a, with his tail between his legs. And, and, and in a sense, Paul was run out of town, and he had to leave town because of the ones who are persecuting him and now giving also the Christians left behind in Thessaloniki a hard time. And so this theme is foreshadow foreshadowed in the bo in the Thanksgiving is found in the body of the letter and maybe you can see that from this little diagram. So the red letters show the verses in the Thanksgiving section that foreshadow the theme of Paul's integrity and the arrows show where he develops that theme at greater length in the body of the letter. Well, that's just one of the four major themes, and so we better keep going. And the second theme is the theme of persecution. Now, I must admit that my slide for this is not very good because it will feed a stereotype of persecution that is historically inaccurate. Right? When we think of persecution, we do think, and it's wrong typically, to think of like lions and, and arenas and Christians being offered up as like flaming torches. And, and this never really happened. Yes, there was this extreme isolated case under Nero but actually it backfired on Nero because the way he treated Christians actually evoked more sympathy for them and that was only a temporary thing and a little later than the time period we're talking about in Thessalonians. So when we think of persecution I couldn't really come up with a good image for that. We ought to think of things more like um, ridicule, ostracization, you know kind of shunning people. Yes maybe there might be if people were angry enough uh, some form of spontaneous violence, but, but there certainly wasn't any organized, systematic persecution in that classic sense. But there was opposition, there was pushback, there was, as Paul puts it in the Greek word, thlipsis, there was trouble that the Christians experienced from their non-Christian neighbors. And Paul alludes to that already in the Thanksgiving section. So Paul says, I give thanks to God because you became imitators of us in the Lord, and then this important phrase, in spite of not just suffering, in spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message, the gospel with joy given by the Holy Spirit. So Paul in the Thanksgiving section acknowledges that when the Thessalonians believed and received the gospel, they did so in spite of severe suffering opposition. And that foreshadows the theme of persecution that's picked up in the body of the letter. Because Paul, in the body of the letter, wants to encourage these baby Christians who, under pressure, are maybe tempted to revert to their former pagan ways. And so you have there a key verse in verse 14 about imitating the churches in Judea because you suffered from your own countrymen the same things that those churches in Judea suffered from their fellow countrymen. But even a greater uh, section of the body of the letter where this theme is picked up is in chapter 3, 1 to 5. And this is where Paul says, I sent Timothy to you. I was so worried about you guys in the midst of your persecution. I sent Timothy to strengthen you and specifically to strengthen your faith. 
And so if you wanted to chart it out in a map format of the letter, so you can see in red, uh, the theme of persecution is found in the Thanksgiving section, and then it's picked up in the body of the letter a little bit in 2.14, but at a greater extent in chapter 3, 1 to 5. A third theme, an important theme, is the theme of proper moral conduct. And you see here a, a young woman who supposedly, anyway, this was my idea for picking the side, is wondering about what she should do, right? You have that question in 2 Peter 3, how now shall we live? Actually, the context there is Jesus is coming back one day, and, and because Jesus is coming back, how shall we as his followers live? There's a connection between end times, eschatology, and ethics. And the same kind of question is found in Thessalonians, because in the Thanksgiving section, this is an important verse, Paul says, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So most of the readers had been worshiping idols, all kinds of pretend gods from Greek gods, Roman gods, Egyptian gods, mystery religion, um, the imperial cult, right? all these competing religions. They're worshiping pretend false gods. And Paul says you turn from those idols to serve, literally in Greek, to be a slave to the living and true God. Now, I know you know this already, but permit me to highlight the fact that we too often think of conversion as a head thing rather than a lifestyle thing. So we think of conversion as, okay, I used to think this way, and now as a Christian I'm converted, I think this way. Or I used to believe this, and now I believe that. And while that's partly true, conversion, of course, is not just a head thing, a thinking thing, it's also a doing thing. How we think, what we believe, intimately impacts how we live. And so for these pagans, these largely Gentile Christians in Thessalonica, to turn from idols, that involves a huge shift in how they live, including their moral or ethical conduct. And so it's not surprising that Paul had to, in the body of the letter, encourage them in terms of how they live ethically, morally. I think there's also a foreshadowing of this theme in that little phrase, your work produced by faith and your labor prompted by love. The third thing is hope. That deals with the second coming, our last theme. But this work coming out of your faith and labor coming out of love, uh, it's, it's hard to be 100% sure. There's a good uh, case can be made that that too refers to the kind of works, the kind of labor, the kind of deeds that Christians do that reflect a, a Christian lifestyle. Paul does pick up the moral conduct in two big parts in the body of the letter. One is in chapter 4, 1 to 12, where he talks about how, how, the, how Christians have to please God, not only in their sexual behavior, their sexual conduct, but also in their brotherly and sisterly love. And then also, at the end of the letter body, he talks about pleasing God in congregational life and worship. It has to do with respecting those above you, and how do you treat uh, troubled congregational members, and things like that. And so if you wanted to map this out in terms of the letter, you can see the red letters give you the Thanksgiving section where the theme of proper moral conduct are mentioned. Most significantly, verse 9b, and to a lesser extent more veiled earlier in 3 of the first chapter. But you can see the arrows point to two major sections in the letter where Paul develops this theme at greater length. Well, finally, and course, you're always excited to hear the word finally because that means the end is in sight, and indeed it is in this longer session. The fourth and final theme, the fourth and final way in which the Thanksgiving section foreshadows or anticipates the rest of the letter to come, and that has to do with the theme of the second coming. And that's found in the Thanksgiving section. Actually, we mentioned it uh, a little while ago dealing with the ending of, I appeal to First Thessalonians Thanksgiving section, the eschatological climax, the discussion we had leading up to the Thanksgiving section of First Corinthians. So now we're back to First Thessalonians in that verse that I referred to earlier, chapter, first, chapter 1, verse 10, where he says, to wait for his son from heaven. That clearly refers to the uh, return of Jesus, the second coming. And then the last part of that verse, well, do I not have it on here? I guess I don't. Uh, the last part of the verse is, of course, also the phrase, uh, to rescue us from the coming wrath, to rescue us from the coming wrath. And I think it is also foreshadowed, this is more clearly in the faith, hope, and love. So we had faith and hope, but the third thing here, faith and hope, sorry, work and faith, uh, and now we have the third uh, kind of virtue, we have the hope. And this hope in the Lord Jesus isn't a kind of generic 
gee, you know, I, I have this general hope in Jesus. You know, I, I'm kind of depressed, but Jesus, thinking about him, what he did makes me hopeful. In this letter, with all of its many references to the second coming, this is more an explicit reference to the hope in Jesus' return. A day when he will come from the heaven and he will rescue us from the coming wrath. The end part of verse 10b. Now this is indeed found in the letter body. It's found in a major section in chapter 4, 13 to 18, where Paul comforts Christians who have died before Jesus' return. And so this is a major part, a major concern of the letter. Some Christians are dying before Jesus comes back, and, and they're worried about their status. Will they miss out on Jesus' return, or will they participate fully in the glory of Jesus' second coming? And so Paul comforts them. And he already knows he's going to do that at the beginning of the letter, and so he foreshadows that theme in chapter 1, verse 10 of the Thanksgiving section, and he develops it at length in chapter 4, 13 to 18. And then the passage right after that also deals with the second coming. So if the first passage deals with what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes back, the next one is, well, what about us who are still alive, right? Because this day of the Lord stuff, Paul, you know, all this Old Testament language about judgment and so forth, it's a little scary, and we're not quite sure if, if we'll be there, or what our status will be on the day of the Lord. And so Paul has to comfort them by saying uh, uh, in chapter 5, verse 9, that God hasn't destined us to wrath picking up actually 1 verse 10 to rescue us from the coming wrath but now 5 9 God has destined us instead for the obtaining of salvation Paul comforts these uh, living Christians too in Thessalonica who were worried about their own status whether they were worthy enough to experience salvation uh, at the coming of Jesus and if you want to see how that's mapped out then again you see the key verse in chapter 1 in the Thanksgiving section verse 10 a and then also or the earlier reference, the hope in Jesus Christ in verse 3. And then that foreshadows in a very clear and impressive way the two major sections in the body of the letter where Paul takes up these topics. So, uh, we've now spent this last session dealing with the three functions of a Thanksgiving section, right? The pastoral function, the exhortative function, and the foreshadowing function. It's the foreshadowing one that I've highlighted the most in my examples. A quick example from Galatians, a little longer example from 1 Corinthians, and then the longest example from 1 Thessalonians. And I hope that these examples do indeed convince you, as I've been suggesting all along, that Paul is indeed a skilled letter writer, so skilled that he already knows where he's going to go in the body of the letter before he gets there. And so what does he do? He foreshadows those key subjects, as well as the tone of the letter, right? He foreshadows those key subjects already in the Thanksgiving section. Well, thanks for your time and attention, and the next time we're together, we'll move on to the third and actually biggest part of the letter structure, the body of the letter, and the different epistolary conventions that Paul uses there.